Okay. All right. We're, we're just going to get things started um, up here because I'm tall. Um, uh, I, I'm Max Evgen, and this is the uh, Working with Digital Humanities, Students and Museums, Why We Should, How We Can panel. Um, I'm not going to introduce everybody here because they can introduce themselves. Um, I've been told in no certain turns that I'm not to speak for any one of them. No. Um, but uh, we're just going to go through a few case studies of projects that we all worked on, um, and then we intend to have uh, a discussion with you guys about uh, any questions you guys have or anything about that. And um, hopefully, we can have you know you guys have a few takeaways on on things you might be able to do or or um, ideas you might have in terms of collaborating with um, digital humanities students um, in the future. Tweets, tell them to tweet. Tweet, yes. Uh, right there at the bottom, we have um, our session uh, um, uh, uh, hashtag, which is um, S2170, which is our, our session number. But be sure to do that with the MCN2016 hashtag as well, because if you don't, there's a, uh, apparently there's, there's like a House Bill 2170, and, or Senate Bill 2170, <laughs> and there's like a few other 2170 things. So make sure to also add the MCN one with it when you tweet. Um, and, and please do tweet as much as you like, um, <laughs> um, just uh, real quick, um, uh, my name is Max Edgen. I work at the um, Michigan State University Museum as Exhibitions Technology Specialist. It's a science and culture museum. So as you see there, we have uh, um, an exhibit with a bunch of uh, quilts in it, and we have some uh, dinosaur casts. And uh, we hold this um, Great Lakes Folk Festival that happens, a very, like, the largest event that happens in uh, that, and that type in East Lansing um, every summer. Um, I uh, in, uh, recently um, planned the facilitation of a digital engagement um, framework um, supervised, and, and a supervised um, an intern, um, Jordan Stokes, uh, you see pictured there um, on Museum Selfie Day. Um, she, um, uh, she was a professional writing major and a digital humanities minor at MSU um, who was doing uh, the internship as a course requirement for the digital humanities minor. Um, and you can see the framework there is the digital engagement framework, and that's what we used um, to develop what was, at the time, the digital engagement strategy, but later turned into the visitor engagement strategy, but you can talk to me more about that if you like. Um, so the facilitation of the strategy was a really giant undertaking, um, you know, even in a relatively small museum, uh, because we had uh, just a series of workshops and meetings, getting the staff there, finding time to get everybody together, doing a lot of data calling uh, um, of, of all the things that we were asking our staff to, to uh, the information we were asking them to provide to fill out the framework. Um, and uh, the skills that Jordan brought in, in terms of research and analysis, um, organization and communication were indispensable. Um, and, it, and, and I, during the whole course of, of, of working with Jordan, I, I didn't see her as, oh, she's just some, an intern working with me. We really had a working relationship that I saw her as a partner in helping to develop the whole thing because she had some really great thoughts about how we might be able to do this thing, how, what, what kinds of things we should, we should be considering when we're talking about um, uh, the, the, the strategy. Um, uh, in addition, uh, the perspectives that uh, um, in DH studies that uh, she provided were, were critical in moving the project forward. Um, she brought a critical eye to the groupings of the areas of the framework, um, and she kept my own judgment in check. Actually, in terms of oh well, maybe we should, well you know uh, maybe we should do this or do that. Um, and um, oh, let me just go back to that slide there for a second. So, you know, that that was when we were developing the strategy, and that was us filling out the, the strategy. So we, we ended up ha having um, uh, these sessions of, of bringing the staff in, and then um, filling out the framework with these um, these these post-its. Um, and the, uh, at, the, at the end of the internship, she gave me um, a, a few deliverables, um, show, showed me um, a blog post that she made that was um, all the experiences that we went through, but also um, gave me a written sum summary of her experience. And in that written summary, she said, I, I learned how to immerse myself in an organization that I previously knew nothing about, analyze concepts, and think strategically in order to assist and outline steps to improve the museum's digital presence. And um, she also added, I had never seen myself as someone who would be working in a museum. However, this internship allowed me to make connections between my identity, career goals, and museum practice, um, which I think is pretty significant because we had a few conversations where she was genuinely surprised that she, you know, about what the operations in a museum that she didn't understand and what kinds of things she could possibly do. Um, and um, 
you know, in, in conversations, I told her that her skills could be beneficial uh, in marketing, public relations, exhibition development, in education, or you know, possibly a role like mine in digital um, in a museum um, with any of those experiences. Um, so my, my takeaways from this is uh, that digital humanities students provide skill and knowledge in a burgeoning area of museum work in terms of, of digital, um, and that museums provide the value of professional opportunities that lead to high visitor impact. Um, that, that even though it was just the two of us on that, that's something where, where she was instrumental in, in the development of, of that, and I, I, I'm very thankful for her for that, uh, for, for doing that. Um, and. Um, with that, I'm just going to uh, let, go ahead and um, introduce our next speaker. Okay. <laughs> no, that's good. I was just making it full screen. Okay. Oh, I am. I am less tall. <laughs> okay, um, I had ambitions of wandering around while I was speaking because I don't like standing behind the podium, but this mic is, I'm afraid that I'll actually break it or something if I, if I try to move around. Um, so yeah, so I'm Kristen Mapes. I'm the Digital Humanities Specialist in the College of Arts and Letters, also at Michigan State University. Uh, that job is confusing to many people, so I'm going to say just very briefly what I do. Um, I do a variety of things. I'm trained as uh, a medieval studies scholar and also as a librarian. So I see myself as sort of a deeply embedded librarian out in the college and basically our humanities college at Michigan State. And uh, my role involves teaching, uh, which is what I'll be speaking about today, uh, both the introduction to digital humanities class that we have for our undergraduates, but then also develop the study abroad program. Uh, I also advise our undergraduate students in our minor as well as um, uh, graduate students in our uh, graduate certificate and work with faculty to develop and graduate students to develop projects whether they're aimed for being grantable in the future or smaller things that they want to experiment with. We also collaborate with folks across the university including Max from the MSU Museum, folks from the library, other colleges around MSU. So we're trying to kind of uh, facilitate a more cohesive MSU digital humanities, which is something that's sort of a challenge to do in any institutional context. But if anyone wants to chat about that later, I'm happy to do so. So today I'm talking about a study abroad program that a colleague of mine, uh, a colleague and I developed to showcase kind of digital humanities, but it really, my take on it really focused on museums. So let me tell you a little bit about that and specifically about this digital humanities curriculum that we have at MSU. So there's a lot of thematic overlaps with, we also have a museum studies curriculum as well, uh, but then we have this separated out. So it's an undergraduate minor for 15 credits. There's two required courses and two elective courses, which I'll explain in just a second. And then there's an experiential component that every student has to fulfill. They can do so through, say, an internship with Max at the museum. They can do so through work that they do at Matrix, for example, which is one of our big digital humanities research center at the university. So they can do it through um, something that bears credit or something that's more of a, a traditional work experience where they're um, paid to do that. It's open to all majors, so we're trying to develop it so that we get more kind of science and computer science majors in the future. Right now we have a lot of kind of humanity students who are doing this to supplement uh, the work that they're learned, you know, doing in professional writing or in experience architecture, which is our major in uh, basically user experience and usability, and, uh, and those sorts of fields. So this extensive list is not even a comprehensive one. When I say there are two elective courses that students can take, that means that they can take any class that I, did, that I deem worthy to count as digital humanities which is kind of nice because I have a lot of leeway to work with individual faculty to incorporate a digital project or a digital humanities component into a class even if it's just for one student. Uh, or it could be that they're doing that for everything and it's a core part of that class. This list is just a running list, we have it on our website as well, of classes that students have in the past taken or that they could take that I am aware of that could count as digital humanities. So it's not a prescriptive list, but it shows you 
some of the range of types of things that we see as kind of fitting within the world of DH. And I see this as something that you know, are always adding to, and I have a couple of colleagues around the university that also have permission to add to this as well because we have a similar understanding of what counts as DH. So one of the ways to fulfill these electives is through this uh, Digital Humanities Study Abroad program, uh, which, as I mentioned, a colleague and I developed, and it's called Technology, Humanities, and the Arts in London. It's a four-week program that we ran for the first time this past summer. It's a seven-credit program, which is a lot of credits to achieve in a four-week period, uh, and two courses are involved, so all students take both courses. Uh, one of them is a general ed course, which is really helpful for recruiting and also brought us students from a variety of disciplinary backgrounds that we normally wouldn't see. So we had students who might have had some experience um, thinking about museums, although we didn't have museum studies students specifically, uh, but we were bringing in students from physics, from uh, chemical engineering. We were bringing in students from computer science as well as students from English. So that was really enriched the conversations that we were able to have. Uh, then we had a scholarship opportunity for students in the DH minor to help incentivize them and make them feel that this was something really involved for them. So because it's a two course program, both of those courses counted as electives for the DH minor. So actually, if you were a student who was aware of this, you could complete the minor in one year, which is a big deal. Hopefully the tweets that I have scheduled are going out so you can get links to this as well. Um, what we did in the class that I taught, which was called Culture, Digital, and Physical, um, focused on questioning what cultural institutions are doing in the digital realm and what their aims are. So we read things about linked data, we read things about what is a database and what is data in relation to museums, libraries, and archives especially. Uh, we looked at the role of social media in museums and had some interesting conversations about how students see that fitting into their own lives. And we talked about virtual reality too. We went and we examined a lot of digital platforms, including things like Europeana, the Google Cultural Institute, and then we looked at specific platforms from individual institutions to understand what are the different metadata um, that's incorporated into each of these. What are the different viewer interfaces? What are the affordances of each? So we didn't do this really in the classroom. We did this by going out to places in London. So we went and we visited some places. And then we met with some places. Uh, this was really the crux of the course. We went and met with folks who work in behind the scenes, whether they're in exhibition technology, whether they're in education, um, or in collections management from these institutions, and they were incredibly generous and wonderful with my students, um, so that they could see from the back end, what are the challenges, both from a big institution like the British Library, a wealthy one like the Welcome Collection, or something that's more modest like the Ben Uri Collection. This is what it looked like. And then we talked about, um, and we, I also wanted to show you here, there's a few, like we looked at the Internet Archive kind of suite that they have going at the Welcome Collection. My students were awe, in awe at the, the kind of factory of digitization that they have going on there. That was very eye-opening, which is actually, I lied, that's this. Here we see the Great Parchment Book, which was this great project that was a collaboration between the University College London and the London Metropolitan Archives to digitize something that was considered completely illegible and undigitizable. And, uh, and we learned about that collaboration and how archives, especially municipally funded archives, have to work with institutions that can provide funding to get projects done. Uh, and we attended some talks and, and saw a lot of different types of things. This was the Museum of London built a Minecraft city and then burned it down for the anniversary of the Great Fire of London, which was really cool. So what did all of this mean? Well, I mean, this is great to go around and do all of these things, um, but what I can tell you the impact that this had, this intersection of technology, museums, digital humanities writ large, is that students, especially students who don't have any exp um, <clears throat> exposure to this otherwise, came away having an appreciation for cultural institutions. These are quotes from their final reflections. Some of them had previously said they just go into a museum, walk around to say that they saw it, and then leave. <clears throat> 
but their experience after this is that they actually understand kind of the decisions and the thought process that goes into making an exhibit digitally in the space, uh, wanting to go and pursue more knowledge on the website later, that sort of thing. And a general appreciation for cultural institutions. So with that, I pass it along. Hi, I'm Phil Lears, as it says up there, at Altitude Madness. I'm going to talk to you about an opportunity that I never expected to have in my job, um, a kind of happy accident that happens when you have a relatively vague job description and an enthusiasm for trying new things. I was hired at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles in 2014 to manage a Mellon Foundation funded grant uh, project. The main objective of the grant is to create web resources um, for an academic audience based on our, our collections and exhibition history. Um, but I'm going to tell you about a completely different project. Uh, so the first thing I did when I was hired, of course, is I looked at the uh, grant proposal. Uh, and two entries in the list of project goals jumped out at me. The Hammer is a UCLA-affiliated institution, and the campus is right up the road from us in Westwood. So collaborating with them made sense, but proximity and affiliation don't guarantee easy partnership. As this first goal here suggests, uh, the museum and particularly the curatorial department viewed partnering with the university as an area for improvement. Um, and in this second goal, I saw a possible point of entry for me. So I took the digital initiative to send an email to Miriam Posner, who's the coordinator of UCLA's digital humanities program. Uh, we had a lunch and I pitched her on the idea of bringing her students to the museum, maybe for a site visit or having them use our collections as uh, subject matter for their research. And she surprised me by suggesting that I teach a two-quarter course with a capstone project. It's an idea that made me extremely uncomfortable, so I said yes and began racking my brains for a subject that I could passably talk about for six months and decided on the Franklin Murphy Sculpture Garden a space in the heart of UCLA's North Campus featuring 72 sculptures by names like Rodin and Butterfield and Hepworth and Calder. And it seemed a fitting choice. It's a hub for student life, a thoroughfare and gathering place, especially for students of the humanities. And the sculptures themselves are part of the Hammers collection. In other words, it's an inter-institutional collaboration which could serve as the basis for a new inter-institutional collaboration. And so it was decided, a two-part course divided roughly into research and development about the Murphy Sculpture Garden taught by me. So my first thought was, shit, how am I gonna teach this course? I'm not an art historian, I'm not a garden expert, I'm not a professor or even an active academic. I know how to do research, I know how to synthesize research into writing, but that wasn't gonna get me through two full quarters of teaching. So I assembled a murderer's row of visiting lecturers, a curator, a special collections librarian, a historian, a landscape architect, a sculpture con conservator, an anthropologist, anyone I thought could illuminate some aspect of the sculpture garden. And the approach worked. Beyond taking some of the onus off of my so shoulders, the experts introduced research angles that I never could have done justice. They helped uh, the students, served as resources for the students as they embarked on their own research projects. And uh, what's more, they helped engender a collaborative spirit and a support network that en encouraged the students to experiment without feeling like they were on their own. Uh, they, I hope, sent the message that knowledge is dispersed and that the student's research challenge is not to master knowledge, but to shepherd it, really. And that the eight students in the class came from a multiplicity of dis disciplines, both undergraduate and graduate departments, certainly helped to emphasize this ethos. At the end of the quarter, the students gave individual presentations, not unlike this one, uh, and turned in research papers that interrogated the sculpture garden from unexpected vantage points with plans for turning their research into uh, actionable projects in the subsequent quarter. I entered the second half of the course feeling really great, which is, of course, a terrible sign. <laughs> <laughs> so I love project-based learning. I think it is a hugely important change of pace for university students that builds practicable skills and is generally underutilized in higher education but it is demanding on the students. In this case, I was asking the students to develop their own projects in a 10-week course 
while also juggling the rest of their coursework and their busy social lives. The course suffered a lot of attrition, going from eight students down to three absolute troopers. I knew I was asking a lot of the students who were working with a tight schedule and with limited resources, but you know who else works with tight schedules and limited resources? Everybody, all of us, probably. Uh, and sure, I might have been setting them up to fail, uh, but anybody who's been listening during this conference knows that failure is super hot right now, and failure experience can be taken directly to the bank. <laughs> so I was determined to impart every bit of project management knowledge that I had gleaned over the years to the brave souls who continued on this journey with me, uh, putting them through the paces of what a real job, my real job, is like. Every week they were assigned a new deliverable. They wrote elevator pitches and mission statements, they made schedules, they created user profiles, flowcharts, wireframes, and they produced amazing projects. Uh, I could not have been more impressed by the investment that these students put into their projects and was really thrilled to have them write posts about their work for the Hammer Museum's blog. Uh, you can find those on our website. The Projects, an app that pairs information about the sculptures with physical and mental health exercises, an experimental documentary about the garden space and narratives of walking, and a 3D garden environment, showed the amazing things that digital humanities students can accomplish given the opportunity. So here are a few things I learned through the course. I learned that many digital humanities programs are looking for people to teach and are willing to look beyond the norm to serve their students' curiosity. I learned that teaching in the digital humanities forces you to reckon with your own limitations and that acknowledging that you need help can set the tone for a collaborative classroom environment. I learned that striking a, a balance between academic rigor and practical development is absolutely key and extremely difficult. And I learned that asking a student to produce a project in 10 weeks is completely unreasonable, uh, but they'll r rise to the occasion anyway. Uh, they take on DH because they're motivated and willing to do the work. Uh, I learned a lot more than that, probably more than my students, but I've only got so much time here. Um, here are some reasons that I feel that museums and digital humanities programs should seek out partnerships like this and like the other ones that you're going to hear about. For the museum, it's an opportunity to inject a new vitality into the workforce pipeline and to grow a new generation of museum professionals who are equally adept at doing humanities research and interpreting that research through digital tools. It's an opportunity to engage with those elusive millennials in a way that isn't baldly self-serving and actually serves them. It's an opportunity to create a meaningful and perhaps lasting connection between students and our collections. And it's an opportunity to amplify the voices of these brilliant people, voices that will sound different from your established institutional address because they think differently, but which are nevertheless very likely to advance your museum's mission. For the student, here are some things that I think that they get out of it. Um, but rather than presume, I would prefer to have uh, a student tell us himself, uh, our next presenter, Alex was one of my students in this course, and I'm extremely proud that since graduating uh, with his bachelor's, he's got a dual fellowship at the Studio Museum in Harlem and MoMA. Uh, he's a very impressive person, and to me, representative of a bright future for museums. This is the bright future for museums. Uh, and I'm really grateful that he's here to talk about his experience with the class, so thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you for being here. Uh, as Phil mentioned, thank you, Phil. Uh, uh, my name's Alex Gonzalez. I'm the public, well, I'm just going to take this in improv. Uh, my name's Alex Gonzalez, and I'm the Public Programs Fellow at the Studio Museum in Harlem and the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And I'm very excited to be here today to share a little bit about my experience um, participating in the course taught by uh, Phil Lears with the Hammer Museum at UCLA. So seen here is my final project, the Digital Sculpture Platform. And this project came together through uh, research with uh, UCLA Special Collections. And through that research, I was kind of combing through archives and found some really uh, great photographs by Julia Sherman, um, uh, 13 sculptures in the collection um, before, before um, when they were installed in the private residence of David and Dolly E. Bright. These sculptures were then uh, installed and gifted to the university in the 1960s uh, for public installation in the Franklin D. Murphy Sculpture Garden. And so that kind of set forth an interest in this narrative of transition of sculptures moving from private to public space. 
I was interested in how visitor engagement around these objects uh, shifted as they moved from the private dwellings of a private residence uh, with limited viewership and how they then moved to a uh, pulsing university setting, traffic by thousands of students every day, how that changed the interaction and the meaning around these works. Um, and so my digital project was then an attempt to extend this kind of narrative into the digital space uh, and allowed me to investigate uh, what that digital space means for uh, these objects, how uh, visitor engagement and understanding around them is recontextualized and also allowed me to explore what that digital space and digital installation looks like, what it could look like, what it should look like. Uh, so I started by rendering 13, these 13 sculptures as a case study. Uh, I rendered it, them into 3D models using 123D Catch, which is a relatively easy to use software, but uh, um, it took some training. Um, as Phil mentioned, it was kind of ambitious at little, a little bit at first, but I, I managed to see it through uh, with the help of um, Phil and a, a lot of the great curators and visiting lecturers in the course. Um, so here, yeah, I, I rendered them into 3D models and installed them to scale. Um, in a virtual reproduction of the physical uh, sculpture garden environment uh, using uh, 3ds Max and vSIM. Um, and so from that, I was kind of going back to that initial transition from the private to the public. Um, and I inferred from that transfer that there was a higher level of visibility and engagement with these objects as they were in a public setting and being interacted with. And so my digital project, I aim to kind of amp that up. And so I, in, the de in designing the final digital project, I was interested in kind of amping up that interactive ability. And so that helped by kind of creating the user design profiles that Phil mentioned um, to kind of design this project um, by kind of taking into account a multitude of expectations and uh, experience with virtual uh, environments uh, so we were looking thinking about teachers how would teachers want to use this how would a student use this how would someone who is uh, is a frequent gamer what would he expect what would he what would it take for him to engage with this for a long period of time um, and so that really informed the final design and so the final project kind of included uh, new interactive features, um, but I think more importantly provided access to uh, primary resource materials um, in the forms of various media. So there's oral histories um, of the artists and the artwork, there's photographs, there's existing scholarship that you can access online that, are tied, that ties you directly back to the UCLA Special Collection Archives online. Um, and so I think overall I argued that this final project was um, kind of presented a new method for the conservation of art materials um, and also for it allowed more access for uh, research interpretation of these art objects um, in new and sustainable ways. So looking back and reflecting upon my experience as a digital humanities student, I realized that I acquired a versatile set of skills that have kind of informed the way I'm able to do my work now at two museums. Um, I develop a set of hard skills. I learned how to render um, 3D objects, um, uh, which is no easy feat. And um, I was actually able to use a prototype vSIM, which is uh, the, the, the platform that it lives on, um, through Lisa Snyder, who was one of, an amazing uh, researcher and professor at UCLA. I, so I was able to use her prototype um, which was really neat. She took me, she kind of held my hand the whole way. Um, it, took a, it took a while, but it, it turned out really well. And so I, I was also able to conduct academic research um, and see through a digital project on my own, um, which is you know, highly invaluable. Uh, but I think more importantly, I was also able to develop a sense of soft skills. I was collaborating with uh, museum professionals, undergraduate students, graduate students, um, curators, you know, scholars from all over the field. Um, and I was able to share ideas, collaborate, and kind of see how things work. Um, and kind of tying back to what Max said um, in his experience with his student, I was able to see myself fully immersed within the museum environment and institution and how things worked. Um, so now I'm a public programs fellow at two institutions. Uh, I am settled in the public programs department um, where I design and produce with my director um, exhibition related programs. Um, and those take shape those take uh, various forms like artist talks, workshop screenings, and we also do partnerships with other cultural organizations in New York. Um, so I think those soft skills were definitely very helpful here. 
uh, I'm, a I'm able to kind of collaborate and share ideas with visual artists and really drive the mission forward for both institutions, which is to kind of facilitate a dialogue around the exchange of ideas around art and society. And uh, I think what's most exciting is to uh, kind of draw a connection between li living artists and growing in new audiences. Um, I'm also still developing my, my toolkit, you know, hard skills and soft skills. Um, and I think I'm really fortunate for this experience because now in my position, I'm still able to investigate the exact role of museums in society, the role of artists in society, because I'm still curious as to why people come to museums in the first place. So my position allows me to kind of further explore and try new things and experiment uh, with kind of, you know, brilliant luminaries in the field. Um, so on that note, I will turn the mic over to Brinker. I might ask your help for a second. Oh, yep. Okay, um, so my name is Brinker Ferguson, and I'm kind of a, a weird one within this group because I kind of have my, my feet in almost all of the different aspects of, of what's been represented. I'm a DH student myself. I'm a fifth year PhD student at UC Santa Cruz um, in, in Digital Heritage, which is a dual degree program both in the engineering as well as visual studies department. Um, I also work uh, at a nonprofit called SciArc, where we digitally document world heritage sites, uh, specifically at risk heritage um, in vulnerable areas. And then finally, I teach as well. And I completely agree with Phil. Um, the course that I teach, I, I just teach one class a term. Um, it's in the architecture and urban, urban planning studies department. Um, and it's very important to me to have both theory based as well as practice based um, learning because. It really affords you an opportunity to, with like boots on the ground, to test these theories and actually push the field forward. So I do a lot of um, training of, of photogrammetry and laser scanning and other digital capture. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is actually part of my dissertation, um, the digital documentation of a Maori meeting house and local community conservation practices. So just to give you a brief 30 second background, uh, the Meeting House, which is in the National Museum of New Zealand, is one of the oldest surviving Whananui or meeting houses uh, built in 1842 near Gisborne on the northeast coast. It represents the high point in Maori carving traditions and its carver pictured here, which is very unique um, with his moko tattoo was known uh, for his very distinct style involving deep cuts in order to give um, figures this very three-dimensional profile. Uh, the Meeting House came to the National Museum in 1867 during the height of the land wars between the British and Maori. It was during this time that the Crown confiscated the Meeting House, dismantled it, and then loaded it on a ship bound for its capital in Wellington. In 2001, the Crown formally acknowledged that had, it had been taken without consent and that this was a breach of the principles in the Treaty of Wakatangi. So, a little animation here. Um, in early 2017, the meeting house will be returned or repatriated to the northeast coast to live on its original location or marae. And that's actually where the meeting house will be placed. But rather than staying quiet about losing a key object from its collection, the National Museum is embracing the return and working with local community, uh, local Maori community, and local high school students in sustainable conservation practices. So this is where I come in. My role will be to help digitally document the meeting house as it stands in the museum today. Um, and work with museum staff as well on a variety of capture technologies such as laser scanning, photogrammetry, motion capture, because um, 
when you're on a marae, uh, the way that you approach a meeting house, there's, there's a whole kind of protocol um, that's quite important. So how you sort of enter the space, as well as 360 degree audio and video capture. So how it is in the museum as it is now and, and how people approach it in the museum. Uh, once the meeting house is rebuilt on its original location, um, I'll do the same type of imaging with the Maori community as well as um, the high school students and compare data sets to ensure that the rebuild um, is, is done kind of structurally in, in a very similar way. Um, the data will go into the archive of the National Museum, the National Library, as well as the archive of the Maori community or Maori iwi. But what I'm most excited about with this project is I feel it's a radical rethinking of conservation practice. It's a hybrid approach adapting museum preservation practices with Maori conservation of both tangible and intangible heritage or tonga. Local community members and local high school students will be trained on how to do these types of digital documentation technologies so that in one year or five years or perhaps 50 years, they'll be able to do the same type of imaging um, and be able to compare these data sets and, and it will inform community conservation practices. Um, so for example, you know, if part of the roof is, uh, you can tell by the data if part of the roof is um, sinking in or something, it, it can help to inform, uh, you know, reconstruction or, or uh, whatever. So there are many benefits to the partnership between museum, national museum, the local students and the Maori community iwi. Uh, for long-term preservation and safekeeping of the meeting house and its new environment. It gives agency to the local community and local students in the management, care, and interpretation of their cultural heritage. It also represents the past as an inseparable and integral part of life in the present. But where my presentation is quite different from others, again, um, is that it has not happened yet. Uh, I actually leave on Tuesday, uh, and I'll be gone until 2017 doing this project, and I will absolutely, you know, via Twitter or whatever, report on, on how it goes. Um, so I'm very much looking to my colleagues, as well as you in the audience, um, to, you know, talk about sustainable um, knowledge transfer. And I think that that's the most important thing here, is that um, because this will be an ongoing project, it's of course important to um, educate not only the students, but also the, the teachers, the high school teachers that will have kind of rotating classes coming every year, as well as the local community, the Maori community, um, and how that knowledge transfer kind of jives with traditional Maori knowledge transfer. Um, so that's something I'm really looking forward to investigating. And um, if anyone's interested, be happy to share um, as things progress. Thank you. And I think now if it's all, all right with Max, we discussed, we'd love, since it's such a small audience, uh, we'd love to really quickly hear if you're a DH student, if you work at a university, sort of why you're interested in um, this talk. So just, if we can go like real fast mm -hmm. and maybe start with you. I'm a senior program officer in the Office of Digital Humanities at the NEH. Um, and so many, I'd say most of the projects we fund um, involve students either undergraduate or graduate to some extent. So. Uh, I'm Greg Albers, I'm the digital publications manager at Getty. And I'm interested, I've been interested in starting to think about digital art history publishing. And I think that bringing in university students like Phil did, or talk, working with university students is a good opportunity. So I've been thinking about that. Uh, my name is Chad Benchafei, I'm the TMS Administrator at the Morgan, and uh, largely it's how do we create better opportunities to, within the academic world and within universities, to start to bring in new technology and new techniques for working with our data. Um, I'm Lisa Scrimmer, I'm the Deputy Director of the Cross Foundation, and 50% um, of our activities focus on fellowships, and so knowing how technology is used with I'm Anna Colmadonna. I am a PhD student at Stanford in the History Department. Um, prior to coming to Stanford, I worked in museum interpretation and I'm currently working on a bunch of digital history projects. 
I'm Tim Stavanius at Ezekama, and I'm a content strategist. I'm here out of curiosity. <laughs> Courtney O'Callaghan, Chief Digital Officer at the Fear and Sacro Gallery, Smithsonian's Asian Art Museum. I'm here because I was interested in how digital planning students bring it in and might give us a different perspective on some of the projects we're doing. Frank Z, digital experience designer at Fear Sacro, also out of curiosity to hear about the projects and their being played. Um, Caroline Colbert from the Gunn Gallery at Kenyon College, but previous to that I was at the Ackland Art Museum at UNC Chapel Hill where I learned and worked with a lot of DH students and actually helped craft a series of seminars and talks at the museum about digital art history along with the art library, which was directly across the building. Uh, Sheila Carey, Canadian Heritage Information back when I was in grad school and did one digital humanities course and I'm interested to know what is going on in digital humanities now. Yoda Sahel, I'm the technology officer at the Academy of Science and Technology Museums. Um, we really love it when students come and use our collections. We've been working with public historians, students, public students, um, and we're trying to um, work out a course with digital humanities um, uh, I'm Cohen Smith at the Atlanta Museum of Art, uh, which is a part of the University of Texas uh, in Austin. And um, so, yeah, we've, we've had a number of kind of small projects, not official EA projects, but I'm really interested in, in working with the community students um, to basically try to increase capacity at the museum in the sense, in, in capacity in the sense of um, them finding things that we don't get into <coughs> problems and, and showing us things that, that we're sort of too locked in to, to even recognize. Hi, I'm uh, Simon Tanner. I have uh, so many DH hats on here, so I should probably explain them. Uh, I'm Professor of Digital Hair. Cultural Heritage in the Department of Digital Humanities at King's College London. Uh, we run an MA program in Digital Humanities. We have uh, the world's first PhD program in Digital Humanities. Mm -hmm. we, we were a, an innovator in that space. Um, we have, uh, also have another hat, which is that I'm Pro Vice Dean for Research Impact and Innovation across the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. And in that role, we've, uh, we've, we've created a activity called King's Digital Labs, which is externalized from our academic department and DH, our development team into a, into a lab environment um, that sits at the faculty level. Because if you probably looked at our sort of nine million pounds of research income a year, uh, in arts humanities at King's, probably about half of it has a DH component to it. Um, so whether that's in English history, classics, theology, music, you know, wherever it is. Um, so, but what I'm always really impressed with when I come to the States is how well you get your students to work with heritage organisations. It's something that we struggle with in the UK. So we work as academics with heritage organisations, with museums and libraries and archives, but often that doesn't necessarily transfer down into, into teaching. And one of, the, one of the things I'm really interested in and always looking for is, is examples of how we can make our teaching um, uh, more innovative as opposed to sitting in quite traditional spaces, even though we, even though we're trying, you know, we're trying, but it's 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 one of those things where we're innovating in the research area, but not necessarily in the teaching area. Okay. So a bit longer. Um, I'm Sherry Berger. I'm a product manager at the California Digital Library, which is a part of the University of California system. So love all the UC representation mm -hmm. on this panel. Um, Go Bruins. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I actually know all of the mascots, so I want to rattle them all off. <laughs> Slugs are my favorite, to be honest. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I work at the aggregation level with all 10 UC campuses, as well as libraries and archives and museums across California. And 
you know, undergrads are probably the biggest consumers of the collections that we put online digitally, but I've just always had kind of a dream of, of going further with that, and, and I think, um, like, I don't know what that looks like exactly, but I think the types of projects that you all have been talking about are really kind of indicative of the, of the ways we could push this more so that undergrads in particular, but also scholars at all levels of the university can be doing more, we, we can do more for them than just like bring our collections out to them as consumers. And so I, I'd love to explore that more really. Hi, I'm Kate Barbera. I'm from Carnegie Mellon University. Okay. I'm an there. Um, recently I've been working with some DH faculty in our library to start um, collaborating more with <coughs> students to work with our archives data, um, just to see what they can come up with. That's been really exciting. Uh, hi, I'm Paul Marty. I'm a professor at the School of Information at Florida State University, and I've served on the faculty steering committee for the university's DH program. Each of the last three times they tried to start one in the last ten years. <laughs> <laughs> this time, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Andrea Ledesma, and I'm a grad student in Brown Public Humanities Program, where my work focuses on using technology in the theory of public history. Uh, I'm also the program's first digital public humanities fellow. There's one higher um, at a postdoc level, and mine brought in for my cohort, so I'm here to sort of scout out some projects. I'd love to hear more about this. Um, because our program, being a public humanities program, and Brown being a pretty traditional hub for DH, especially in their library, we're trying to figure out what it means to be public in the digital communities. And I'm Catherine Stalen, and my uh, degree is in uh, digital medieval art history. Of course, that makes sense together. Um, and then in my current role um, at Dartmouth, the question is, you know, what is this piece and what are the different, you know, which is why I'm curious how people interpret digital humanities because I can think of many, many forms. <laughs> So, um, first off, my students, when we went to London, we went and met with Stuart Dunn at King's College. So thank you, St King's College. Um, okay, let's, does anyone have any specific questions you had for us about, or that you'd just like to ask us generally about any of the projects or about this topic generally? Um, thank you for spending the time to introduce yourselves to. That was really enriching, I think. Yeah. So. But was there a point at which you sort of were asked to articulate your experience during this course and how it applies to what you're doing now? Yeah, I think there was there was definitely some middle ground there. So after this this course was taken during my last year uh, as a senior at UCLA, um, and then I started my position um, in September, no, no, October of last year. So in that three month gap, I was interning. I was one of the um, Getty interns. Uh, um, what was it, multicultural Getty intern. Um, I was interning at uh, Spark Social and Public uh, Art Resource Center in Venice, and I was working under Judy Baca um, in her digital lab in, in partnership with UCLA. And so that was kind of the middle bridge in the sense that I was still continuing my digital work. I was working on restoring murals digitally, but under the lens of her work and the historical work that she, the, the legacy that the, her work carries, where she was going out into the communities and created the Great Wall of LA, which is you know one of the largest murals in the world, um, and doing that through community activism. So, in that sense, I was 
continuing my digital work, but really also exposed to on the ground work as well. And so I think that resonated particularly with the Studi Museum, which is a very culturally specific institution, um, which you know serves under um, mis underrepresented communities that are disenfranchised, in this case, um, committed to showing the works of African-American artists. So I think that was a nice, a perfect middle ground for me to segue into um, a new position that not doesn't really give me the resources to continue that digital the digital work, but I'm still engaging audiences with art collections. He says he was taking a picture because yeah, Phil yeah. asked him to just for the tape. You know, we wanted to get that out there. Yeah. Um, I guess my question is probably. Uh, for uh, Max and Phil, I'm, I'm curious uh, when you you know brought these students in to, to work in your museum. What uh, you know, we've talked a lot about what the students learned from you guys. What did you get from them? Like what? How, how was was your perspective on the work you do changed? And if, if so, how did that? Work? Do you want to the question? Oh, yeah, um, um, Coven had asked if, um, if, if, as a result of the working with the students, had, had our perspective on our own work changed to any degree? Is that representing that well? Um, <clears throat> I, you know, I, I, I would say uh, it, it, certain, it, it did for me in terms of you know, how I was going to be working with students, right? The, th the things that I would be planning on working with students on the, the types of projects because um, you know we, we the, the structure around um, the internship had you know certain guidelines of you, you should do this and you should do that and you should do this but we decided together that well you know we can change that a little bit you know as long as this works for this particular project um, and that that certainly informed how I've been working with students in the future is that I, I've had other opportunities of students uh, for, to work with students in other other ways and I, I've, I've been tailoring the, their particular needs to um, to what uh, the, the, the construct of, of the experience to their particular needs things that are going to help them best um, you know I, I don't I don't know if that's necessarily a, a change but um, it, you know, it, it, I, I think that does have some sort of, in, it, it, it did inform my practice to a certain degree. Yeah. I'd say teaching this course was extremely impactful on how I uh, understand my job as well as how I understand certain parts of the, uh, the museum's kind of public. Um, I think it's great to get out of the kind of echo chamber of the museum and talk to people um, and it's hard to do that without seeming fake or like you're trying to get information out of out of people uh, and so like I said I, you know to be able to engage with students in a way that is not self-serving and I'm actually providing something useful for them um, uh, I think help break down some of the barriers that you get when you try to you know um, collaborate or speak with people outside of the museum. Um, and then in general, kind of uh, having the students go through the motions of, of things that I was doing in my own practice at, at work is uh, really instructive to see how they problem solve, to see what they struggle with, to see where I could improve. Um, like I said, these uh, students are incredibly resourceful. They knew all kinds of stuff that I had no idea about. Digital humanities, came to UCLA the year I graduated from their graduate program, so I never got to study it. So they had a huge head start on me, um, and, and I relied on their base of knowledge to uh, kind of like bolster me. And um, yeah, it pointed out some blind spots that I have and some areas that I wanted to improve, and just kind of reaffirmed my thought that we need to bring voices like this into the museum community you know, whether we're bringing them into museum careers or not, like, these people are doing what we want to be doing, and um, they're doing it well. They're doing it better than, than we are in a lot of cases, so uh, we need to, you know, we should give them a platform as much as we can. And, and I, I want to kind of qualify my previous response because I think that I misrepresented myself. <laughs> <laughs> because I realized I was like, you know something? She was the first student that I worked one-on-one um, -on -one with um, in, in my academic career as a, as a teacher. Um, I, I taught courses, but that's the first person that I just did one-on-one. -on -one. And 
now I've done every, every time that I've worked with a student, I, I've, I've been taking those lessons. So to say that it was somewhat impactful, I think is complete misrepresentation. Um, that yes, it had a significant impact on, on, on how I work with students in the future. Um, and, and I agree with Phil that, you know, that she came with a whole other skill set that I didn't really know um, that, that directly impacted what we were doing. Um, and so I, I really could rely on her as, as, like I said, like a team member, not, not just like, oh, my intern who's doing, I mean, granted, she was doing things that like were sort of the, the sort of more busy work things, but she could do those things in five minutes that would take me 20. <laughs> and, you know, so I, it, was, uh, it, it was easy that she'd come back to me and then we'd start talking about all sorts of wonderful things and, and all these ideas of how we can make this thing work. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it was a very significant impact on my work. Well, I want to qualify my answer to a rebuttal. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Have, have, have time for one more? Yeah. Okay, so I have a question for, again, in the practice of digital humanities, both in terms of what you've done, but also in terms of what you envision coming up for you. What elements do you feel you would really like to have in place provided for you? Because it sort of, it's not part of the inquiry process, but actually just a way to kind of get there. Um, I guess, yeah, what, what infrastructure do you, uh, would help you keep the focus on? Give me the question. Yes, so the question is for the people who are kind of doing digital humanities in practice, uh, what sort of infrastructure, groundwork would you like to have already seen like in place for you to then start your grounds of inquiry? I, I won't be the only one to answer, mm -hmm. but yeah. okay. And interpret it. Interpret it however you feel. Okay, so one of the things I want to say is everything, please be in triple IF, please. Mm -hmm. um, stickers. No, I, I mean that seriously because as someone who's teaching introductory level digital humanities and trying to, um, on the ground, interpret what digital humanities is to a wide range of people across the university from undergraduate students to senior level faculty, um, having some struct some things already sorted out in terms of the having collections that we can go ahead and use and bulk download. Um, and, and then be able to put into tools that are developed enough that I can, you know, share them with people. Those are, those are really, really helpful things to be able to get started doing digital humanities. So if you, if you, and if you're a place that houses collections and you're putting them online and you can make it so that I can check all on the results list and download all of the metadata, of everything, that will change everything. That will be amazing. Because then my students can do projects with your work without having to use something like Importio, which is a freemium service for web scraping, because I don't teach them programming in an intro level class. You know, that's my, one of my things. I'm sure others have other things they want to add, perhaps. Um, so I guess I'm going to kind of approach it as, as a, a teacher for my one class and sort of how I structure uh, digital humanities and, and work with my students. Um, we don't necessarily work with the museum per se, but what I find very important um, is having, you know, again, the kind of practical. So I, I teach... Um, not, not just in university, uh, I teach you know, how to do photogrammetry, how to do laser scanning, um, everything from setup, capture, to um, you know, visualization of data. Uh, and so I have, at, at SciArc, we have it pretty well packed. This is, you know, it's a four day process, you know. And so in a, in a course, we kind of extend that a little bit more, but it's, you know, day one is set up and talking about the theory, day two and three is capture um, and making sure you have all like really great documentation and you didn't miss anything. And then day four is um, the post-production. So um, in terms, does that kind of answer? I know that's a little bit diff certainly different for <laughs> What would be use? I mean, I have to agree with with you having a way to just have it kind of packaged up and ready for us to use, so that um, us as teachers can hit the ground running and really have a succinct project within, you know, the academic quarter or academic uh, semester. Mm 
And with that, I think we have to stop that because we're at our three o'clock mark and there's another assessment in here. But thank you guys thank so you much. Me. Thank you. I really, we really appreciate it for coming.